Book three, sections ten to thirteen of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book three, sections ten through thirteen. Section ten. There is also a doubt as to what is to be the supreme power in the state. Is it the multitude, or the wealthy, or the good, or the one best man, or a tyrant? Any of these alternatives seems to involve disagreeable consequences. If the poor, for example, because they are more in number, divide among themselves the property of the rich, is not this unjust? No, by heaven, will be the reply, for the supreme authority justly willed it. But if this is not injustice, pray what is again when in the first division all has been taken and the majority divide anew the property of the minority is it not evident if this goes on that they will ruin the state yet surely virtue is not the ruin of those who possess her nor is justice destructive of a state and therefore this law of confiscation clearly cannot be just if it were all the acts of a tyrant must of necessity be just for he only coerces other men by superior power, just as the multitude coerces the rich. But is it just, then, that the few and the wealthy should be the rulers? And what if they, in like manner, rob and plunder the people? Is this just? If so, the other case will likewise be just. But there can be no doubt that all these things are wrong and unjust. Then, ought the good to rule and have supreme power? But in that case everybody else, being excluded from power, will be dishonoured, for the offices of a state are posts of honour, and if one set of men always holds them, the rest must be deprived of them. Then will it be well that the one best man should rule? Nay, that is still more oligarchical, for the number of those who are dishonoured is thereby increased. Some one may say that it is bad in any case for a man, subject as he is to all the accidents of human passion, to have the supreme power, rather than the law. But what if the law itself be democratical or oligarchical? How will that help us out of our difficulties? Not at all. The same consequences will follow. Most of these questions may be reserved for another occasion. The principle that the multitude ought to be supreme, rather than the few best, is one that is maintained, and, though not free from difficulty, yet seems to contain an element of truth. For the many, of whom each individual is but an ordinary person, when they meet together, may very likely be better than the few good, if regarded not individually, but collectively, just as a feast to which many contribute is better than a dinner provided out of a single purse. For each individual among the many has a share of virtue and prudence, and when they meet together, they become in a manner one man." who has many feet and hands and senses, that is a figure of their mind and disposition. Hence the many are better judges than a single man of music and poetry, for some understand one part and some another, and among them they understand the whole. There is a similar combination of qualities in good men who differ from any individual of the many, as the beautiful are said to differ from those who are not beautiful, and works of art from realities, because in them the scattered elements are combined although, if taken separately, the eye of one person, or some other feature in another person, would be fairer than in the picture. Whether this principle can apply to every democracy, and to all bodies of men, is not clear. Or rather, by heaven, in some cases it is impossible of application, for the argument would equally hold about brutes, and wherein, it will be asked, do some men differ from brutes? But there may be bodies of men about whom our statement is nevertheless true and if so, the difficulty which has been already raised, and also another which is akin to it, that is, what power should be assigned to the mass of free men and citizens who are not rich and have no personal merit, are both solved. There is still a danger in allowing them to share the great offices of state, for their folly will lead them into error, and their dishonesty into crime. But there is a danger also in not letting them share." for a state in which many poor men are excluded from office will necessarily be full of enemies. The only way of escape is to assign to them some deliberative and judicial functions. For this reason Solon and certain other legislators give them the power of electing to offices, and of calling the magistrates to account, but they do not allow them to hold office singly. When they meet together their perceptions are quite good enough, and combined with the better class they are useful to the state. 
just as impure food when mixed with what is pure sometimes makes the entire mass more wholesome than a small quantity of the pure would be but each individual left to himself forms an imperfect judgment on the other hand the popular form of government involves certain difficulties in the first place it might be objected that he who can judge of the healing of a sick man would be one who could himself heal his disease and make him whole that is in other words the physician and so in all professions and arts as then the physician ought to be called to account by physicians so ought men in general to be called to account by their peers but physicians are of three kinds there is the ordinary practitioner and there is the physician of the higher class and thirdly the intelligent man who has studied the art in all arts there is such a class and we attribute the power of judging to them quite as much as the professors of the art secondly does not the same principle apply to elections for a right election can only be made by those who have knowledge those who know geometry for example will choose a geometrician rightly and those who know how to steer a pilot and even if there be some occupations and arts in which private persons share in the ability to choose they certainly cannot choose better than those who know so that according to this argument neither the election of magistrates nor the calling of them to account should be entrusted to the many yet possibly these objections are to a great extent met by our old answer that if the people are not utterly degraded although individually they may be worse judges than those who have special knowledge as a body they are as good or better moreover there are some arts whose products are not judged of solely or best by the artists themselves namely those arts whose products are recognized even by those who do not possess the art for example the knowledge of the house is not limited to the builder only the user or in other words the master of the house will be even a better judge than the builder just as the pilot will judge better of a rudder than the carpenter and the guest will judge better of a feast than the cook this difficulty seems now to be sufficiently answered but there is another akin to it that inferior persons should have authority in greater matters than the good would appear to be a strange thing yet the election and calling to account of the magistrates is the greatest of all and these as i was saying are functions which in some states are assigned to the people for the assembly is supreme in all such matters yet persons of any age and having but a small property qualification sit in the assembly and deliberate and judge although for the great offices of state such as treasurers and generals a high qualification is required this difficulty may be solved in the same manner as the preceding and the present practice of democracies may be really defensible for the power does not reside in the dicast or senator or ecclesiast but in the court and the senate and the assembly of which individual senators or ecclesiasts or dicasts are only parts or members and for this reason the many may claim to have a higher authority than the few for the people and the senate and the courts consist of many persons and their property collectively is greater than the property of one or of a few individuals holding great offices but enough of this the discussion of the first question shows nothing so clearly as that laws when good should be supreme and that the magistrate or magistrates should regulate those matters only on which the laws are unable to speak with precision owing to the difficulty of any general principle embracing all particulars but what are good laws has not yet been clearly explained the old difficulty remains the goodness or badness justice or injustice of laws varies of necessity with the constitutions of states this however is clear that the laws must be adapted to the constitutions but if so true forms of government will of necessity have just laws and perverted forms of government will have unjust laws section twelve in all sciences and arts the end is a good and the greatest good and in the highest degree a good in the most authoritative of all this is the political science of which the good is justice in other words the common interest all men think justice to be a sort of equality and to a certain extent they agree in the philosophical distinctions which have been laid down by us about ethics for they admit that justice is a thing and has a relation to persons and that equals ought to have equality but there still remains a question equality or inequality of what here is a difficulty which calls for political speculation 
for very likely some persons will say that offices of state ought to be unequally distributed according to superior excellence in whatever respect of the citizen although there is no other difference between him and the rest of the community for that those who differ in any one respect have different rights and claims but surely if this is true the complexion or height of a man or any other advantage will be a reason for his obtaining a greater share of political rights the error here lies upon the surface and may be illustrated from the other arts and sciences when a number of flute players are equal in their art there is no reason why those of them who are better born should have better flutes given to them for they will not play any better on the flute and the superior instrument should be reserved for him who is the superior artist if what i am saying is still obscure it will be made clearer as we proceed for if there were a superior flute player who was far inferior in birth and beauty although either of these may be a greater good than the art of flute playing and may excel flute playing in a greater ratio than he excels the others in his art still he ought to have the best flutes given to him unless the advantages of wealth and birth contribute to excellence in flute playing which they do not moreover upon this principle any good may be compared with any other for if a given height may be measured against wealth and against freedom height in general may be so measured thus if a excels in height more than b in virtue even if virtue in general excels height still more all goods will be commensurable for if a certain amount is better than some other it is clear that some other will be equal but since no such comparison can be made it is evident that there is good reason why in politics men do not ground their claim to office on every sort of inequality any more than in the arts for if some be slow and others swift that is no reason why the one should have little and the others much it is in gymnastics contests that such excellence is rewarded whereas the rival claims of candidates for office can only be based on the possession of elements which enter into the composition of a state and therefore the noble or free-born or rich may with good reason claim office for holders of offices must be freemen and taxpayers a state can be no more composed entirely of poor men than entirely of slaves but if wealth and freedom are necessary elements justice and valour are equally so for without the former qualities a state cannot exist at all without the latter not well section thirteen if the existence of the state is alone to be considered then it would seem that all or some at least of these claims are just but if we take into account a good life then as i have already said education and virtue have superior claims as however those who are equal in one thing ought not to have an equal share in all nor are those who are unequal in one thing to have an unequal share in all it is certain that all forms of government which rest on either of these principles are perversions all men have a claim in a certain sense as i have already admitted but all have not an absolute claim the rich claim because they have a greater share in the land and land is the common element of the state also they are generally more trustworthy in contracts the free claim under the same tithe as the noble for they are nearly akin for the noble are citizens in a truer sense than the ignoble and good birth is always valued in a man's own home and country another reason is that those who are sprung from better ancestors are likely to be better men for nobility is excellence of race virtue too may be truly said to have a claim for justice has been acknowledged by us to be a social virtue and it implies all others again the many may urge their claim against the few for when taken collectively and compared with the few they are stronger and richer and better but what if the good the rich the noble and the other classes who make up a state are all living together in the same city will there or will there not be any doubt who shall rule no doubt at all in determining who ought to rule in each of the above-mentioned forms of government for states are characterized by differences in their governing bodies one of them has a government of the rich another of the virtues and so on but a difficulty arises when all these elements coexist how are we to decide suppose the virtues to be very few in number may we consider their numbers in relation to their duties and ask whether they are enough to administer the state or so many as will make up a state objections may be urged against all the aspirants to political power for those who found their claims on wealth or family might be thought to have no basis of justice 
on this principle if any one person were richer than all the rest it is clear that he ought to be ruler of them in like manner he who is very distinguished by his birth ought to have the superiority over all those who claim on the ground that they are free-born in an aristocracy or government of the best a like difficulty occurs about virtue for if one citizen be better than the other members of the government however good they may be he too upon the same principle of justice should rule over them and if the people are to be supreme because they are stronger than the few then if one man or more than one but not a majority is stronger than the many they ought to rule and not the many all these considerations appear to show that none of the principles on which men claim to rule and to hold all other men in subjection to them are strictly right to those who claim to be masters of the government on the grounds of their virtue or their wealth the many might fairly answer that they themselves are often better and richer than the few i do not say individually but collectively and another ingenious objection which is sometimes put forward may be met in a similar manner some persons doubt whether the legislator who desires to make the justice laws ought to legislate with a view to the good of the higher classes or of the many when the case which we have mentioned occurs now what is just or right is to be interpreted in the sense of what is equal and that which is right in the sense of being equal is to be considered with reverence to the advantage of the state and the common good of the citizens and a citizen is one who shares in governing and being governed he differs under different forms of government but in the best state he is one who is able and willing to be governed and to govern with a view to the life of virtue if however there be some one person or more than one although not enough to make up the full complement of a state whose virtue is so pre-eminent that the virtues or the political capacity of all the rest admit of no comparison with his or theirs he or they can be no longer regarded as part of a state for justice will not be done to the superior if he is reckoned only as the equal of those who are so far inferior to him in virtue and in political capacity such a one may truly be deemed a god among men hence we see that legislation is necessarily concerned only with those who are equal in birth and in capacity and that for men of pre-eminent virtue there is no law they are themselves a law any would be ridiculous who attempted to make laws for them they would probably retort what in the fable of antisthenes the lions said to the hares when in the council of the beasts the latter began haranguing and claiming equality for all and for this reason democratic states have instituted ostracism equality is above all things their aim and therefore they ostracized and banished from the city for a time those who seemed to predominate too much through their wealth or the number of their friends or through any other political influence mythology tells us that the argonauts left heracles behind for a similar reason the ship argo would not take him because she feared that he would have been too much for the rest of the crew wherefore those who denounce tyranny and blame the counsel which periander gave to thrasybulus cannot be held altogether just in their censure the story is that periander when the herald was sent to ask counsel of him said nothing but only cut off the tallest ears of corn till he had brought the field to a level the herald did not know the meaning of the action but came and reported what he had seen to thrasybulus who understood that he was to cut off the principal man in the state and this is a policy not only expedient for tyrants or in practice confined to them but equally necessary in oligarchies and democracies ostracism is a measure of the same kind which acts by disabling and banishing the most prominent citizens great powers do the same to whole cities and nations as the athenians did to the samians Caians and lesbians no sooner had they obtained a firm grasp of the empire than they humbled their allies contrary to treaty and the persian king has repeatedly crushed the medes babylonians and other nations when their spirit has been stirred by the recollection of their former greatness the problem is a universal one and equally concerns all forms of government true as well as false for although perverted forms with a view to their own interests may adopt this policy those which seek the common interest do so likewise the same thing may be observed in the arts and sciences for the painter will not allow the figure to have a foot which however beautiful is not in proportion nor will the shipbuilder allow the stem or any other part of the vessel to be unduly large any more than the chorus master will allow any one who sings louder or better than all the rest to sing in the choir 
Monarchs, too, may practice compulsion and still live in harmony with their cities, if their own government is for the interest of the state. Hence, where there is an acknowledged superiority, the argument in favour of ostracism is based upon a kind of political justice. It would certainly be better that the legislator should from the first so order his state as to have no need of such a remedy. But if the need arises, the next best thing is that he should endeavour to correct the evil by this or some similar measure. The principle, however, has not been fairly applied in states, for, instead of looking to the good of their own constitution, they have used ostracism for factious purposes. It is true that under perverted forms of government, and from their special point of view, such a measure is just and expedient, but it is also clear that it is not absolutely just. In the perfect state there would be great doubts about the use of it, not when applied to excess in strength, wealth, popularity, or the like but when used against some one who is pre-eminent in virtue, what is to be done with him? Mankind will not say that such a one is to be expelled and exiled. On the other hand, he ought not to be a subject. That would be as if mankind should claim to rule over Zeus, dividing his offices among them. The only alternative is that all should joyfully obey such a ruler, according to what seems to be the order of nature, and that men like him should be kings in their state for life. End of Book 3 Sections 10 through 13